So welcome. This is our uh, Expresso training. I'm Carlos Leva, CEO of the Hip Survival Guide. Um, my associate, John Nelson, is on. He's actually going to do the, the demo. Martin Gwynn, who you guys know, Director of Operations, uh, is also on. We're going to keep this uh, pretty informal. We're going to stick to how to do a risk assessment as much as possible in, 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 a, in a matter of hours. Uh, and Martin, why don't you go ahead and unmute everybody? There's only about four or five of us on the phones. So we're going to keep this, I mean, on the webinar, we're going to keep this pretty informal. That means that, if, that people, will be free, people will be free to speak up and um, ask the question. So. Uh, okay, I have just unmuted everyone, and uh, Dr. Superman has joined us as well. Hello, everyone. We're getting some. We're getting some feedback, like like there's a uh, okay now it's gone, but now it's back. It's some. Martin. Yeah. Uh, uh, if that persists, we're gonna have to. You're gonna have to experiment and mute one mute one person at a time so we can figure out where that noise is coming from. First of all, mute everybody just to make sure it goes away. All right, everybody. Okay. Everybody's muted. So right. So uh, now here's what we, here, here's what we can do. We can we can turn it back on, uh, or you guys can just enter questions in the chat screen, um, and and Martin will field the question, and then we'll field the questions. Normally, what we do in the webinar, I I, I, I want it to be more free flowing, but obviously I don't, we can't have that kind of feedback. We're not gonna uh, get anywhere. Try turning everybody, unmuting everybody. Um, uh, we'll try one at a time. Try one person at a time and see if we get the, the feedback. That's exactly what I'm doing. Yep. Uh, so who's that? Ken, uh, it seems to be coming on your line so far. Yes, it's just just limited to Ken's line. Okay, yeah. well then turn everybody else turn start turn everybody else on. Is everybody else on? Yes, everyone else is on. All right, then Martin, why don't you do a, a short introduction and just going to be on, on. Hopefully, everybody's okay with being on a on a first name uh, basis. Do a short introduction of who's on, um, and uh, and then we'll get started. Okay, uh, we have uh, Chris Billingsley. He's, Hi, Chris. Uh, uh, IT for um, um, covered entity. We have Ken Eckhart who can't talk uh, because of that. We have Dr. Cecilman who has a two practice group, and Jim. I'm not. I know you got your group there, but I'm not sure how much you how much um, you guys do. You have you're in three states, I believe, as I remember correctly. Jim? Oh, well. So those are did the we people. Lose? Did, uh, did, we lose? did we lose Jim? Or? Um, Maybe um, he's having mic issues or doesn't yeah. have a mic. Or... Okay, well, let's see. Can you chat with uh, I just want to make sure everybody's still on board. Can you yeah. chat with Jim? Yeah. Uh, let me just chat with him and ask him if he's still here. And if he is, he needs to put in his audio pen. In fairness to Ken, since Ken, Ken can't talk, let's just mute everybody, and we'll take questions the way we normally do via the okay. webinar, and, and then we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll get started. Okay, and I'm I'm uh, before I turn it over to John, I'm going to say a few words uh, as to what we're trying to accomplish today, um, and uh, we will actually be live on Monday, and Martin will be um, sending you your credentials, which is the same credentials, uh, user ID and password that you use to log into. 
uh, customer hub or where we keep uh, the rest of our products. Now, what, what, what we want to focus on today is really how to do your first risk assessment in, in a matter of hours. And, and it, the, the way that we're able to do that um, is not only are we able to do something, a quick risk assessment, but this risk assessment will cover and does cover the entirety of the HIPAA security rule which is what you need to comply with, with the, with the risk assessment. And to, to keep things in focus, because sometimes it's a little bit confusing, the risk assessment step is part of the first standard of the administrative safeguards in the security uh, rule. It is an analysis-only implementation specification. You're not actually implementing uh, controls to reduce risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate. You're just identifying which controls you should implement to reduce those risks to uh, levels that are reasonable and appropriate. And it turns out that every one of the implementation specifications in the security rule is nothing more than a control. Like, for example, one of the implementation specifications is implement a disaster recovery plan. Well, if you don't have a disaster recovery plan, that's a vulnerability. Okay? Implementing a disaster recovery plan is a control that mitigates the risk of that vulnerability, okay? So we've taken that abstraction and we've pre-populated Expresso with 150 risks. Um, I don't know how many threats, how many vulnerabilities. John has those numbers more um, on top of his head, but not, not, not a huge number. But each one of the HIPAA, HIPAA security rule implementation specifications are covered. So if you were to implement each one of those controls, you would be compliant with, you know, what you needed to do for HIPAA, right? And so now HHS, nor us, nor anyone really should expect that you're going to implement all these controls at one time. Some of them are really hard to implement. You know, some of them two-factor authentication. Some of them are addressable, yada, yada. But this is, the, the, my, my point here is, and then I'm going to ask uh, just for preliminary uh, questions, just to make sure that we're all sort of, you know, singing off the same page, is, the, the important point here is, is that even though we're showing you something that can be done in a matter of hours, it, it fully covers the security rule. And it would be a risk assessment that you could hand off to HHS and say, hey, here's proof that we've done one. Are we, are we going to get better at it? Yes. It, it, it will Expresso allow you to do more and more rigorous risk assessments as you start adding security objects? Yes. Can you uh, upload your own threats and vulnerabilities? Yes. Okay. All that is true. But the fact that we the, the fact that we can do it in a matter of hours does not uh, take away from its validity. Okay, so with that, I'm just going to open it up to, uh, for for any uh, prelim questions, and if there are none, I'll turn it over to John. We we don't have any questions at this point in time, Carlos. I'm sure they'll come through. Sure. Okay, John, have at it. Okay. Yeah, that was um, that was well said. Uh, hi, everyone. Glad to. Uh, go through this training here today with you and um, we're going to uh, just go straight to the heart of um, getting a risk assessment done A to Z. Let's see, I am not a robot, I don't think. All right, so there is a lot of uh, information here, and we're going to have uh, a lot of training materials going over uh, each of these tabs, all of the information here, uh, all of the functionality. But today, risk assessment in a matter of hours, so we're going to go straight into a risk assessment. All right, this is the baseline risk assessment. So this is what comes pre-populated with Expresso. As Carlos mentioned, there are 150 risks pre-populated. There are also nine threats. There are um, uh, and there are 29 vulnerabilities and controls. Now, uh, vulnerabilities and controls are the same because, as Carlos explained, one is the counterbalance to the other. Uh, we, we like to use the analogy of matter and antimatter. You have the vulnerability uh, and you have the control that addresses that vulnerability so it can be exploited. So those are the numbers, and from those nine uh, threats and 29 vulnerabilities, we have uh, come up with 150 risks. So as you can see here, most of these uh, all say unassigned, uh, and um, that's how Espresso comes right out of the box. So uh, 
where you see on the sign here that you haven't touched it. It's just, um, you know, it's still got the new car smell on it. So, John, let me, let me jump in here and, and uh, sure. state a little bit about um, the basis, the theoretical basis of this. We took the, the NIST specification for doing risk assessment, which is a seven-step process, and we essentially productized that. Okay, and there's a, a at the heart of the NIST uh, process, there's this equation uh, that, that is discussed. It's never really highlighted as, a, as an equation, but, uh, but that's what it is. It, but it's not, not really mathematical, it's subjective, but just having it in the form of an equation makes it easier to talk about. And so each risk, for, e for each risk, there's a threat vulnerability pair. Okay, one threat, one vulnerability. Okay, and what you what you have to do is assign. Uh, now we haven't done this. We've loaded the threats, we loaded the probabilities, we created the risk, but the work of actually assigning the probability and the impact, as we'll talk about, is work that you have to do. Obviously, this is not like magic that we're doing. It's work that you have to do. But you have to go through there and say, okay, what is the probability that this threat will actually exploit this vulnerability? Like, um, so you know, if you um, if you didn't have a, a generator backup power supply, and, you know, you needed to uh, get to the internet because that's where your EHR, that's where your electronic records are. Okay, um, that would be a threat vulnerability pair. And so, what would the probability? Now, again, it's not mathematical; it's just high, medium, or low. And this is this is totally okay with HHS because it doesn't really lend itself to some mathematical. It would drive people more crazy than than it already does. Okay, and so. That's the first thing. What is the what is the actual subjective probability from your point of view, from your point of view that this threat will impl will exploit actually exploit this vulnerability, and then you have to assign assuming that that happens. What is the impact to your business mission? Is this going to bring down your entire practice? Is it going to just limit your ability to do appointments? What is the impact? Okay. So then the risk and the impact has high, medium, or low. Okay. And then the risk is a function of the probability of a threat exploiting a vulnerability times the impact, times all this subjective, right? All this subjective, but times the impact to your business mission, and then you calculate, quote unquote, a risk, and you assign that risk high, medium, or low, okay? And then we've taken it to the second level that John will show you is, then we've actually applied controls. We've actually said, well, these are the controls that should be applied to these risks that we pre-populated for you. But the work on your part is to go through these 150 risks and click on, yes, we think this is a high probability, this is a low probability, this, this would bring, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you have to give some thought. It's not, it's not magic. You have to give some thought to each one of these risks. But essentially, you're just going to be clicking on whether something is, is, is highly probable, what the impact is. And that's what John is going to walk you through now for, for, a, for a set of risks. Feel free to stop and ask us questions through the chat at any time, and Martin will, will stop us so that we don't get too far ahead of ourselves. Right, right, and um, that's essentially the process I was, um, I was miming. Um, <clears throat> And those uh, points were being made, and uh, that's it, it's really as simple as as going through uh, each of the risks here that we pre-populated and making some decisions. How likely is this to happen? What will be the impact if it does? Okay, so with those two things in mind, what's the uh, risk level? And you're and you're making that uh, and you're making that analysis. You're stepping through that um, that uh, algorithm that you know of uh, T of a threat vulnerability pair multiplied, quote unquote, by a impact to come up with your risk. That is one, uh, that's just one transaction that you're going to, um, to carry out 150 times, essentially. And um, at this point, I'd like to point out two things. One, uh, the naming uh, convention that we've used here, uh, risk 100, risk 97, um, these are just uh, how how Expresso comes out of the box. The naming can, uh, the naming of these risks is, um, is is really arbitrary. You know the substance is in you know the data that that's underneath, but it's I mean, also completely changeable. Right. Let me make a comment on that and why why it's arbitrary. Right. Because you could, although 
obviously we want to name these espresso something or other just so that you know so our customers would know that these are ones that we pre-populated okay but but when you say what is what is its what is its espresso risk 100 what does that mean and I've, I've had this question it's like it well it means the same thing as you know my my risk or my risk one or my risk it, in other words John click on espresso risk 100 right the thing that you have to focus on and the thing that may not be that as clear when when we're clicking here is the the, the real definition of a risk is this particular threat vulnerability vulnerability pair that we have right now the threat is direct access attack the vulnerability is you don't have a disaster recovery plan to recover from it so if you were subject to a direct attack either ransomware or denial of service or something that just just totally uh, kept you from doing business and you had no disaster no, no disaster recovery plan no backup anywhere right you'd be dead in the water and so that's when when you're assigning this risk level high medium and low and in TV probability, you're assigning it to this information that's on th on this prior screen. You're thinking that okay, so what you're thinking is okay. The threat is direct access attack. The vulnerability is uh, no disaster recovery plan. Okay, I, I get that. Then you say okay, I'm going to edit this. I'm going to edit this and go give it give it uh, its subjective value. So let's just go ahead and edit this, John. I just I edit again this particular one. All right. So as I just changed the name here, just as an example. Uh, we try to make this as flexible as possible because uh, each one of you just in this room are going to have to uh, address you know, very different uh, situations with your organization. So, um, so it's intentionally flexible and scalable. So let's and and, let's say and, we're having and that's a good pretty, time. right. That's pretty much it. I mean, that's pretty much what the NIST NIST requires you to do is go through go through these and identify. And obviously, even this hundred and fifty. Uh, uh, risk. There's no rule that says that you have to address all 150 when you go to the next step in the security rule. This is again, this is purely analysis. This is no doing here, no implement, no writing in that previous risk assessment to satisfy your risk. You have to go write the the the, uh, the disaster recovery plan. You just have to note that you don't have one, right? And that becomes a control that if you're going to implement it, obviously you you're going to have to write one. Right, but that's not the, that's not this step. This step is just identifying those things that you have to implement. And what we've done is every every one of those things that you have to implement is like a matter antimatter becomes a one of the implementation specifications of the security rule. Okay, so that's a mouthful right now, guys. But and, and any questions at, at at this point? No. Um... Let me see if there's any hands raised. Sometimes the questions come in later. Um, no hands are up. Um, I, I guess everyone's got it. Uh, well, I think maybe too early for that. It's too early to ask questions. So yeah. I, mean, I mean, we don't really want to go through all this 150 because you're going through the same thing. So we're really trying to get at do you, conceptually. Do you understand? Uh, but let's show you. Click, click on a, a a different. Okay, you see, you see the fact that John renamed this this uh, espresso risk one to direct attack no plan. I, I would suggest as a best practice that you don't rename the espresso risk so that you know that these were the risks that espresso pre-populated for you, just so that you can identify them later. Once once you get started with adding your own risks, your own threat threats, and your own vulnerabilities. You can um, uh, you can assign any uh, develop any taxonomy that you would like that makes sense to you. Okay, and of course you are free to go back and rename these 150 to something that that makes sense if that uh, if, if that works for you. You know, uh, the, the only the only reason you wouldn't want to do it is just just so you would lose track of these are the 150 that we identified. Now we are going to give you the we are going to give you the Excel spreadsheet that pre-populated these risks. Okay, so you'll have that file as a reference. If you ever needed to show it to an auditor or somebody like that, you, you would have that file. And so even if you renamed all these risks, you would always have that. Um, John, well, well, let's go back and look at a risk, though, and see, like, the associations with a risk. Sure. All right. Let's stick with our risk 100. So here you can see uh, the controls associated with the risk. Uh, 
Um, this comes pre-populated. This is directly from the security rule established and implemented as needed procedures to restore loss of data. Now, let, me, if, let, let me speak to that, though. What that means is when it comes pre-populated is we've already assigned this first control, established and implemented needed procedures to restore any loss of data. We've already assigned this first control to that risk. So this is an, this is a, a, a controlled risk in the way that, that it's talking. You could, for your own uh, purposes, um, say, well, you know what, we think that for this risk we should add some of these other controls. Now really what you're adding is these other controls, I just got to tell you, these controls come directly out of the security rules. So we've done sort of what we believe is the hard thinking of it's not like you would really come in here and add five controls here. We've already added the control that we think goes along with the vulnerability. But in the future, we don't want to preclude the fact that, yes, you can have more than one control that is trying to attack uh, or defend against a particular vulnerability. Okay? You can have as many as you, as you like. In this case, you know, there, I don't believe, John, yeah, I think there, there may be. There may be cases where we, we, we assign two, um, two controls from a security rule to one risk. Is that correct? Uh, no, not to the same risk, uh, so but that's, that's just one. how it comes out. Uh, uh, yeah, from what we have pre-populated, uh, yes. there is one control for each risk. Okay. But, you okay. know, it doesn't have okay. to be that way. You know, right. And so we thought, we thought after reviewing the rules, that's all you needed. You know what I mean? Because, again, the, the implementation specifications in the security rule, those are the requirements. Those are the things you have to comply with. So we covered all 29 of them and as controls, okay? So essentially that provides full coverage of the security rule. It's not like we got a double, it's not like we're missing something, right? We got all 29 covered and we thought, okay, that, that, that's probably uh, sufficient. Now, if you click on the history button here, John, for this one, yeah, this one. So you can, you can see that we've, we've edited this, uh, this particular uh, risk three times. And this log will keep growing, so it'll show if you've come back and edited the risk, if you change the name, whatever, you'll, you'll, uh, it'll come back and show you that. Right. And uh, <clears throat> but so uh, you'll, you'll be making your own risks as well. Uh, we start out with 150, but you're going to have things that, uh, that are specific to you uh, that we can't just provide out of the box. So if you create a new risk and if, or if you create a new control to add to, say, some security objects or, uh, or to risks, then, um, then it's actually quite simple to do that as well when you, uh, by um, by going through all of these click dialogues, it's it's actually uh, there's okay. This is actually our biggest uh, our biggest input dialogue. Um, most are you know maybe three fields, but risk uh, is really where everything comes together. So um, so there are a few more uh, pieces of data to input, but you're not going to be doing this. Uh, you know you're probably not going to create a thousand risks at a time. So it should prove uh, to be a Pretty good, painless uh, affair. It was for us. Let's see. I am responsible for this. Oh, of course. Now, one, one thing to note: right now, Espresso, uh, in, in its first incarnation, is, is not intended to be uh, for multi-users. Okay. I mean, you can share it. You can share it multi-users. It's obviously software as a service. You can share the credentials. Multiple people can get in here. Multiple people could get in here. Um, uh, at different times and run reports and things like that, but you know we don't have it set up so from one organization five users, uh, five different users could use it. Now that, that may be that may be coming down the road, but we 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 actually don't see that as something that we're going to be hitting like right off the bat. Release 1.1, release 1.2, uh, etc. Um, John, so I, I think since there are no questions, they kind of get that what you would do, I believe, and maybe we'll get more questions later, what you would do with each one of these risks. So what, how would you produce a report that, a, let's say you got audited by HHS and you were supposed to do one of these desk audits, how would you produce a report that, says that, that provides something that you would give to HHS? Exactly, exactly, and this is where, this is the proof in the pudding. So let's go to risk assessment. You know, auditor says, uh, did you perform one? Yes, we did, and here's the proof. So let's go back and say everything from 
the end of June to today. So we have four options here. View, uh, just viewing uh, right here on the screen, and this is your uh, this is your proof. This is your visible, demonstrable evidence of complying with uh, with performing a risk assessment. And uh, no uh, risk assessment is perfect, but uh, to produce um, a, a complete data set like this over the course of a few hours by going through that uh, analysis, that TVI analysis over and over, um, about 150 times produces this. Now, obviously, you, you, wouldn't want to, you, you wouldn't want to show a risk. I mean, you wouldn't want to show risk unassigned here. Uh, but that, on the, I mean, an auditor wouldn't know what unassigned is. Unassigned is just our message to you that you haven't gone through and thought about what, what, what the probability is and what the impact is to your organization. That's the hard thinking part, okay? But we've eliminated, and believe me, we've tried, and you guys know that have looked at our spreadsheets. Anybody that's tried to rationalize this problem and looking, staring at blank sheets of papers, just know how enormously complex it is to get started. Uh, and so we've taken that. Uh, we've abstracted that complexity and we say, okay, all you really need to do to get going is think about this threat vulnerability pair, assign it a probability, and what does that do? Well, first of all, it, it will get you out of willful neglect land where, where the fines start at $50,000 per violation because at least you've done a risk assessment. That's, this is like the minimum thing you have to do. If you haven't done a risk assessment uh, for the security rule, you're toast. You're dead in the water. This is... This is a this you can show this is visible demonstrable evidence that hey we've gotten started and now we'll talk more and more this is not this is not the webinar for this we'll talk more and more about uh, other ways that you would address an auditor the fact that we have a methodology and a program the fact that we have checklists and scorecards and all the other the, all these other things that make up part of your compliance program right now today we're just focused on on this one particular thing risk assessment which happens to be the um, well, one of two most important implementation specifications in the entirety of the security rule. The second one is the second one is the standard that's that's the implementation specification that's called I think risk mitigation, and that's where you actually implement the controls. Okay. Now let me talk a little bit about implementing the controls. For example, you know some of these controls are like uh, training, provide training to your staff. Well. We've given you 16 classes of training. But to, satisfy, to actually satisfy that and say that you actually implement it, not only analyze it, but actually implement it, well, make sure you run your people through the training. right? Where the control that says you've got to have policies and procedures, well, we have policies and procedures out of the box for the privacy rule, the security rule, right? The breach notification rule. We have it for cloud and social media, et cetera. We have these policies as part of the subscription plan. If you haven't routed them to your organization, if you haven't reviewed them and gotten people to sign, well, then that's part of the risk mitigation. Do that, right? So it's not like we're creating this risk assessment. It's just an analysis. We're not providing you tools to actually implement the controls. We are. Now, are we providing 100% of the tools to implement? No, that's, 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 not, that's not possible. You know, some of it, some of it is, is, you know, like you've got to scan your network and things like that. that those, those are different things. But could you show that you've made significant progress on the entirety of your implementation of your HIPAA compliance initiative with our products? The answer to that is clearly yes, you could. Any number of things that you could show that you've met, and then you could show a plan vis-a-vis -vis our scorecards as to what is missing, what else what else that you have to do. And I guarantee you, you do that, you can make a good faith argument that you haven't stuck your head in the sand, that you're actually trying to uh, get with the program and protect uh, protect the PHI. Um, Carlos, I was going to make a suggestion that uh, I unmute our guys one at a time for any specific questions they might have, if they would just raise their hands. Uh, that's fine, however you guys want to do it. Um, you know, and then they can ask their question directly. Sure. Something, sure. Gets, something always gets lost in the translation. So, 
Here we have the, uh, the citation as well for each one of the controls uh, that Carlos was talking about. So uh, this shows the, uh, the fact that Expresso uh, can meet your needs uh, for a risk assessment and, uh, and complies with the security rule by definition rather than just, uh, well, it's got pretty good coverage. Well, we know it's got coverage because this is where, um, this is where the requirement is and this is uh, already paired up, of course, with, uh, with your risk to go along with it. Right, so the control shows you, allows you to click on and get back, goes to the HIPAA Survival Guide website and would show you the full source of that implementation specification that you're complying with, okay? Uh, and also, uh, in addition to that, this, uh, go back down to the screen you're on. Oh, sure. Go back, so this PRAR, um, this is actually pointing to a checklist item in our uh, privacy rule checklist um, that would give you additional information regarding this particular control. There's also a cybersecurity council that's an international organization that also promotes controls. It's completely outside of HIPAA. It's not U.S. government based, but it's well known internationally and it has like, it's like top 20. So, so it's not like, it's not like um, you, 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 you you have to have like millions or thousands of controls, okay? This is like IT 101. The, the, the top 20 or the ones that HIPAA specify, they're, they're really absolutely critical. You absolutely have to have these. They're a, they're a floor. If you don't have these, you're, you're just not, you don't have any kind of foundation at all, you know? Uh, then as you mature or as you actually try to um, plug certain holes uh, as a result of maybe an attempted breach or whatever, then you can begin adding additional controls, adding your own controls, uh, et cetera. But if you look at, for example, uh, well, John, let's go, let's go and look at our, our threats. So we, sure. can give, so we can give the group a little bit about sort of the, the um, yeah, so click on Express. So, so we have a, a um, Really, what we're going to we're going to rename uh, we're going to rename this because our our developers are actually wrapping up the production version right now. So this is still on in the test. You, if you back up, John, to the types. Sure. Just back up one level. We're going to call these uh, instead of threat types, threat categories. Okay, mm -hmm. and it's more consistent with our security objects and all that. But the, the, we have one threat category right now, which was the default, which was Espresso. Again, mm -hmm. why do we call it Espresso? Just so that you know that these were the ones that we. So, denial of service, direct access attack, fire hacking, here's the thing, under each one of these you could probably have dozens if not hundreds of vulnerabilities, okay? And literally, if you go to the IBM X-Force database or other industry places where they track uh, the, the threat landscape, you're, you're into like hundreds of thousands of uh, potential threats. Right, we've condensed those. Uh, we've condensed those because nobody can manage that that a threat landscape of hundreds of thousands and make any sense of it. So we say, you know what? Some of these, for example, let me go back. John, stop, uh, stop clicking for a second. Go back to the. Um, okay. uh, yeah, just stay here for a second. Um, sure. For example, if you have um, if you have hacking, right? There are a million and one ways that somebody can hack. Um, your network, okay? Now, the, the thing is, we focus on what, what do you need to do to reduce that risk, right? It, it doesn't matter. It, a, a lot of times the response is going to be, well, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, encrypt our data. We're gonna, you know, the, 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 the responses are not, uh, are, are finite. And so we saw no value of listing 101,000 ways that you would get hacked. So hopefully you see that we've, we've, again, we've tried to rationalize the problem, not really interested in the fact that you can be hacked a thousand and one ways. What you're interested in is those five or ten things that you can do to prevent the hacking, right, or to minimize the risk of the hacking or to reduce the risk. This is the, these are the, what we call the weasel words, but these are the words that come out of uh, the HIPAA security rule to reduce risk to levels that are reasonable and appropriate to an organization of your size, complexity, resources, sophistication, uh, et cetera. Okay, so you can, you can see we, we, 
we've limited that to this number of risks, and we we fit, and then we're going to go th go through uh, vulnerabilities. And again, these are it's red, so, right? Yeah, and we're going to call these categories uh, the same thing. And here, the here are the ones that we came up with, and this is where this is where you can begin to see the uh, John's matter antimatter. Okay, the security rule says. Uh, you should. You, this is not mandatory because you know we. I'm not. I'm not trying to get into what's addressable or required in, in, in the security rule. But the security rule does say you should have encryption unless you know you have some damn good reason not not to essentially. But no encryption. What what is the what is the control for that to encrypt? The security rule says you should have a facility access control and validation process. If you don't have one, what's the control for that? implement one. Well, one of those things that you're implementing are all the implementation specifications that the security rule requires. So again, by definition, if you've implemented these 29 controls, that's all there is in the security rule, by the way. There's 29. That's it. There's not 100, 150, 1,000. There's 29. Now, a lot of them are not trivial. You know, actually implementing a disaster recovery plan is not a trivial thing. And we, we plan to add to our product suite as we go forward, for example, a, a, a pretty good template of what should be in, in a, a disaster recovery plan that would allow you to fill in the blanks uh, and for your organization and be able to pull that out and say, we've met, we've actually done this. We've thought about the process. We know who, um, you know, we know who has what role and what responsibility. Here's our plan. You know what? That's that's pretty good for a, a small or mid-sized practice, even for a larger practice, right? And we've We've actually walked through this in a tabletop testing environment. You've probably done more than 99% of your uh, of, of your peers. So we're going to work where where we don't have products that are addressing some of these controls. We're going to work harder to to fill those sort of gaps going forward. Uh, but if if um, if there are no questions, then uh, Martin, has anybody raised their hand? No, uh, we don't have any questions at this point. Um, uh, uh, I could open it up to, you know, one of the participants. If I open it up to James, I know he's got his compliance officer with him, I believe. Well, yeah, open it up. Open it up. I'm, I'm a little surprised that there's no questions at all. Let's don't be shy. And Jim, are you are you there? I don't know if you can hear me or not, but I'm, my name is Joe Wade. I'm the compliance officer. I work with Jim. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we can hear you good, Joe, and we don't hear any. We don't hear any static. Yes. Uh, no, I think you guys have done a good job going through it. Um, I imagine if I the questions we might have, I think might be after we go through it and uh, and kind of see, you know, how it takes us through that. But for the most part, I think it, it looks great. Well, and what we don't, what we, and what we're going to go through is, is next is what we want you to focus on. We know we we're calling this a beta release, so let, let's talk about that. It, it's going to be in a production environment. In other words, this is not. We're not asking you guys to beta test this thing. We've tested it. You know what I mean? And we feel we wouldn't be releasing it otherwise. What, why we're calling it a, a beta release? Because there's some things that, like, instead of threat types, we would rather call them threat categories. And there are some little nuances that we should we, we would uh, we would want to fix before we say this is totally production. On the other hand, we want to deliver the product because we know a lot of you want to create a risk assessment. And but we want you to sort of uh, focus on this part of it because you're you're that's sort of the main thing, right? The, to create the assessment as a practical matter, if you're a compliance officer. You would want to create this assessment, go through that process, and say, "Okay, I get that." Produce the report. God forbid you got audited. And it doesn't matter because Espresso will let you keep a history of reports of risk assessments. Okay, you can go back in time, produce the risk assessment from, you know, 2016, four years from now. All right, mm -hmm. and and so we're, and so we have certain processes in place so that if there's security objects or things that are related or risk and controls that are related to a particular uh, risk assessment, we don't allow you to delete them so that you historically can, um, uh, we can replicate what went on last year and the year before that, uh, et cetera. You know, so 
that's sort of the, that's that's why we're calling this thing a, a beta release, and, and and we expect like to get to a production release like in three weeks or a month. So the things that we have that are missing are you know things that are that are uh, not anything that will keep us from shipping, but things that we want want to fix pretty quick. And then obviously, just like any other uh, piece of software, there's going to be input that that we get from uh, from you guys that. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll decide. Okay, is that the next release that we implement, etc. Right. So now, with that, um, what, one of the things that we haven't talked about is security objects. Okay, and there may be some questions here, and, and part of it is part of it is a um, semantics, and, and, and at least conceptually to understand it. So what we call security objects are you could think of it as you could think of it as inventory first, and then we're going to explain to you why it's not really inventory the way you think about it or assets, right? So part of security objects, security objects in our in our grammar is what you apply controls to. Let's say you apply controls to your PCs, to your pads, to your networks, to your phones. Okay, all those things we would categorize, and 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 Espresso is going to ship with a category scheme for security objects, essentially inventory, right, one way to think about it is inventory, is first um, a category, so you may, you may have security, you may have the category of devices, and then underneath devices, you would have, um, you could have the categories of PC, pads, phones, network routers, blah, 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 and then you would have the individual asset, the individual PC, the individual pad, et cetera. Okay, that you want to apply controls to. Notice that what we've done, and this is where a lot of people get totally hung up on not, not having the ability to do a risk assessment is, what we're calling this out of the box, generate a risk assessment in three hours or less, is we are doing a, in a security object list without, stands, any security objects. You don't, in other words, putting in your inventory is not a at required first step before you do a risk assessment with Espresso. Okay? You can do it without any inventory at all. And nothing in the security rules says that you've got to have all your security objects in there before you do your risk assessment. In fact, most of the, uh, a lot of, a lot of, if, if not most, of the implementation specifications coming out of the security rule apply to all security objects, like having a disaster recovery plan. Well, that doesn't just apply to your plan facility, it applies to your router, it applies to everything. Okay? And so, a lot of people get sort of um, caught up in, oh, we got to have, you know, it, it, either either they get caught up in it or they're imposing their own impediments and saying, oh, my God, we got to get an inventory of all this stuff before we can even get off the ground. It's not true. It's not required. Um, okay? And hold on. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to point out something. I know James and his group have been working on their risk assessment waiting for this, and they would like to know how they can import what they've done already, even though it's not required for this particular step, as you just pointed out. When you say, when you, I just want to make sure that I understand, when you say import, like, their inventory? Their yeah. assets? Yes. Okay, so, okay, so, so before, before we go on to how we do that, um, we have import functionality that, that, um, that, that John will demo here uh, in a second. Um, or, or show you at least, but the the thing to understand is that it, it's more than assets. Okay, your workforce is part of your security objects because you apply controls to your workforce. What kind of controls? Well, training for one. Okay, uh, your your processes, your clinical processes, your financial processes, anything that touches. Uh, protected health information. Well, you can apply controls to those things. So that's why we call it security objects. It's, it's a bigger abstraction than just hardware and assets. It, in, it includes people. It includes buildings. It includes rooms under buildings. Right? It's a much broader concept than just hardware. Okay. And uh, so with that sort of with that backdrop, it's sort of John. It, so what we've done is laid out laid out um, CSV formats that if you put your assets in this particular delimited format, we will import them into uh, Expresso, right? And we have certain fields that we say are required, and we have 
uh, actually a CSV import log that will tell you what fields need to be present, which ones can't be null, uh, et cetera. And if you put it, if you can get it uh, in that format, then we will, we will import it. So just as an example, we've got a uh, test security object. Uh, and actually, before we open this, uh, actually, maybe we can do it right here. So hey, hey guys, we'll go through. Uh, if, I, if you lose me for a second, I'm just going to get some water. I'll be right back. Sure. So uh, here, we're just going to um, just select your CSV file, and it um, and it imports it, and it. Uh, Sorry if uh, things get a bit loud. There's um, uh, some heavy-duty landscaping going on uh, outside. So um, you uh, get your reports from uh, from uh, from your import. So if you have uh, let's say 100 security objects that you're trying to upload, and for some reason uh, there is uh, there was put in miscorrectly or or something was out of format, it won't hang up everything. It will uh, import everything uh, it can uh, successfully and tell you uh, which things didn't go so well. So let's take a look at what fields are actually required. It's never where it, it, you want it when you want to find it fast, right? <laughs> That's right. Well, actually, we didn't we didn't anticipate we were going here, but since there weren't questions on the other stuff, we might as well cover. Might as well. Right. All right. So here are all the uh, uh, fields that are required for your CSV: your category, class, the security object itself, meaning it's a short description like uh, PC one, um, and it's a long description could be CEO, PC. Uh, unique identifier. This uh, is meant to be uh, unique across all of your security objects. So, if you have any um, naming convention already in place, uh, then you know, say MAC addresses for some devices or room numbers uh, for you know exam rooms or you know what have you, server rooms. Uh, importance. Importance is an interesting um, uh, field. Uh, basically, how critical is this particular thing to your organization? Is it um, you know is it the, your database server that ha that has your entire organization captured on it? Then yeah, that's pretty high. Uh, something pretty low uh, might be um, might be a room where there's where there's no reason for PHI to ever go there. That nothing sensitive is in there. Uh, active. Um, we have this active field because you want to maintain a historical record of your security objects. And the best example here might be your workforce. So people come into your workforce, they exit, they might be on leave for some reason, maternity, what have you, and you can uh, so select this to be yes, no, uh, and it's purely a binary thing. So either they're still uh, present in the organization or they're not. And this goes for PCs and devices, rooms, and you know, this, is, the expansion. This, this is also one way that you would handle a delete on, on assets that are no longer in your inventory or like John said, people that have left is that you would mark it inactive, uh, and it's just informational, uh, but then it, you wouldn't delete it because you, you would show that, hey, yes, it's inactive now, but when we ran our first risk assessment back in uh, October of 2016, it was active, okay, and now, 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 it's, uh, now it's going away. So, I mean, so, it, it, you know, I mean, this is relatively straightforward. You, you, you obviously um, have to do some work to get it into this particular format, uh, so that we can uh, upload it. But once you do, we can we can take in you know your your entire inventory, and obviously you could your workforce and all that. All that would be imported uh, in the same way. Right. Exactly. So personnel. Actually, that's a class. Okay. So uh, let's right. say. Um, right. So I think that I think that I think they get this done. We don't have a you know, full, you know, list here, but that's how that answers the question, Martin. Any, anything else along those lines? Um, nothing at this time. Okay, so John, so go back to go back to Espresso and see what else we can sort of just kind of point out. Um, 
Yeah, you could import types and threats and things like that if you know from other industry sources. Uh, that you know, if there were a bunch of threats that you wanted to implement, uh, so we allow you to do that. Um, one thing that we didn't show uh, is that you can export uh, not only produce reports, but you can ex export your reports into um, Excel as well, like or like a risk assessment of a report. You can run a report and then export it into Excel if you wanted to do something uh, in another system or something, you know, with that information. All right, so here's our download. And that will be hard to find. <laughs> All right. And uh, I think one uh, one feature to uh, discuss as well is notes. Um, yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's why I, wanted, I lost track of it, yes, is, is the notes feature, yes. It's, um, it's pretty helpful for information that uh, that you really that just doesn't have a home. Uh, it has uh, a procedure that isn't uh, that isn't captured anywhere anywhere else. A policy. Uh, so well, we know that there's a lot of that sort of free floating information out there, and, and notes is our avenue to actually collect that and all in one place. So if there's something particular to not just a security object, this is uh, the notes feature uh, is extended to. Uh, a lot of our other categories here as well. Uh, but, this but, but specifically, though, for security objects, uh, we envision that there's a lot of information, uh, for example, about servers, about network routers, and settings, and things like that. That God, know, you know, God knows that if something happened to your IT guy, you know, who knows what you would do because he had, he may have it somewhere, or she may have it somewhere, but God knows where it is, right? As far as somebody else coming in. And trying to find it, so we envision that with important objects like servers, routers, etc., you know, things like that, you may want to keep certain information that is relevant to how you re how you reboot it, how you restart it, you know, what has to, what order you have to do these kinds of things. Uh, here, not because not 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 because Espresso was built for that, but because it's, Espresso then starts function as your single version of the truth, where you can gather this information. You can at least say. You know what? We're gonna until we come up with a better place. We're gonna store this uh, in in Expresso along with uh, along with this object. Right. Exactly. Do we um do we have any questions at this point, Martin? Um, no, we don't. Um, let me just open up one at a time and and uh, see where we're at here. Hey, Chris, are, uh, do you have anything that you wanted to add or question? No, sir, not the time. Okay. And I'm not sure whether this is Jim or James. Uh, this is Joe. I'm okay as well. Thank oh, Joe. You. Yeah. Jim or James. Yeah, I'm good shape too. Okay. Um, Ken, how about you? Anything you want to know? No, I'm good. Um did you like what you saw? Yes. Okay, I'm going to mute you. So Martin, your... why don't you talk a little bit about then what the process is. Um, obviously, we're going live uh, the, the 15th, so and, and um, this group will be the first two of, of our customers to go live in the production environment. Um, you will be emailing them their credentials uh, when? Uh, their credentials are the same as the username and password in in uh, Customer Hub right now. What they need is the logon address, and I will be sending them out Monday. Okay, right. So it's going to be uh, it, you're going to log in. Everyone actually, you know, with their own user ID and password, will be logging in at, at the same uh, URL. This is all hosted in case any. Uh, any of you want to know some of the sausage making on a uh, Microsoft Azure cloud platform, and you know, with with all the um, backups and transaction logs and all that that that, that go along with uh, Microsoft's implementation of its uh, cloud strategy, and and we feel pretty comfortable uh, having gone with Microsoft. Obviously, they're a leader in the enterprise. They they just won one of Gartner's magic quadrant buttons for their for um, you know their cloud services, and I think they're going to be 
um, a, a leader, continue to be a leader in this space. So we've been really, really pleased with uh, the Azure uh, environment as far as reliability uh, and all that sort of thing. So um, Martin is your point of contact right now uh, for support. So Martin, when you send out the URL, obviously send out the email address support at threelinespublishing.com, uh, our 800 number, you know, how they can get a hold of us. And for right now, Martin, it's going to uh, be the single point of contact, and then we will get to, uh, obviously, if we have to escalate things to our um, uh, development team, uh, but we believe um, and that it is um, or we, again, we wouldn't be releasing it stable enough for you guys to, to get started, uh, to do your first risk assessment, to get comfortable with it. And there also will be, well, Martin, okay, so let's talk about, uh, just guys, indulge us for a, a few more minutes here. I know, I know you don't, I don't have any questions, but we, we can take this opportunity to give you some more information. Along with, along with uh, where you log in right now to get all of our products, there's going to be an Espresso page. On that page is going to be the Espresso's User's Guide. Okay, it, there's going to be this um, CS, CSV format of how you upload your security objects. There's going to be training videos, right, similar to what we went to, uh, through today, but there'll be a whole series of them, like how do I add a security object? How would I associate a control with a risk? You know, various eight or nine or ten of these how-to uh, training videos. So that's where you will look for support material. It's logging into Customer Hub, going to the Espresso page, and the, uh, the collateral, the support collateral that we're going to distribute um, is going to be there. Okay, and probably, um, go ahead, Tom. No, it's it's Martin. Martin. Uh, Martin. Also, up there now is the uh, Expresso User's Manual already and the um, data sheet, these others, and plus the taxon taxonomy will be going up there too, correct, Carlos? Yeah, yeah, we've we've created we created a taxonomy for, um, for example, we we have a suggested taxonomy that, that that's already going to be implemented for security objects, where where and the user's manual will will show you what that is as a graphic of it, you know, devices, workflows, process. We've talked about uh, some of these. That all be that'll that'll be already there for you, and of course you can change that taxonomy uh, uh, as as you see fit. We're also going to have a taxonomy for threats, threat categories. Okay, Here, hey, here's four or five that we think are relevant. Same thing for vulnerability categories. You can use ours or you can um, add, add your own. Um, again, as you see, fit. same thing with impact types. You know, what's the impact of my mission? Well, it's catastrophic. It's isolated. It's and the reason that we're doing this is taxonomies are hard. If anybody's ever tried to create taxonomy, you know that you're staring at that blank sheet of paper. And even if you're a subject matter expert. Uh, in the field, they don't—they don't come easy to you, right? So what we're trying to give you, um, and we're not—we're not—we're not saying these like the best, you know, uh, taxonomies or you know the, uh, that you won't be able to prove on, uh, improve on them, improve, improve upon them, but you will—they do fit, you know, some majority of use cases, and there's something that you can say, okay, yeah, okay, well, we'll add these other three, and we'll change the name of these, and that'll be good. So. Martin, you could probably just to save everybody from going out there at the customer hub is um, go ahead and email everybody. I would suggest you go ahead and email everybody the user's manual. Okay. Uh, that, I sent them the user's okay. manual before the meeting. Okay. All right. All right. Then yes, I will be sending you the import type documents and then just put, and then uh, we'll probably um, uh, I think we probably have three or four videos that we'll have ready by by Monday that should be on that page as well. So uh, if, there, if there are no questions, I think we just wrap it up uh, with that. Okay. Um, I'm just curious if uh, besides Ken, if anybody else has any opinions about what they just saw, how they feel about it, and uh, if they could just put them into the question areas so that we can read them or I can unmute you any way you want to do it. But I, I want to get a, a feel for what you thought, so I'm gonna. Martin, it might, it might be preliminary for that. I, th I think uh, I think it was Joe. I, I think you know they they're gonna want to get uh, their hands on it, well, it and, and do that sort of thing. You know, so I, I got one yeah. remark back so far. I'm really looking forward to using this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. That's uh, 
we we got to feel good too, guys. We worked on this, or I didn't work on it. Uh, Carlos and, and John worked on it uh, very diligently to give you the best product we possibly could that satisfies all your needs. So that that was that was a feel good for you guys, uh, John and Carlos. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm looking. Uh, I'm looking forward to having everyone here. Uh, you know, really sink sink their teeth into it and uh, and let us know. You know what we can, uh, uh, what we're doing right, especially what we're doing wrong. Uh, because you know this product, just like risk assessments themselves, are ongoing. You know, uh, we're really starting. This is this is v 1.0, and we're actually looking to. Um, uh, we're already planning improvements for the future, how we can streamline things even more for you. And we're looking forward on on really starting this with everyone here. Yeah. So you 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 will definitely see you will definitely see release 1.1 probably in two or three weeks. I mean, you may not, you may not even know it because it may, it may take you that long to sort of you know get get oriented and all that. And we are already have release 1.1. Uh, you know, 1.1 out there, and 1.2, and, and and so forth. Uh, obviously, we'll be making announcements so that you know these will these will happen transparent to you because it's SaaS. You know, it's SaaS-based software, so you'll wake up and you know the new version will be there, and and and, um, and ho hopefully we didn't break anything. But we got thousands of regression tests that we run before we release a new environment, so we're pretty confident that that each time we do a an upgrade. Uh, that it's going to be as at least as robust as the as the prior one. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you for participating. We look forward to getting your your feedback. And if you think of some questions that you guys have after you uh, after you leave the webinar, then then uh, email them to Martin, and we'll go we'll go from there. And Martin, if you if you guys you and JT um, actually no, let's let's just let's have a conference call after the fact so we can um, uh, just you know gather our thoughts here. Okay. okay. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Thank Patrick. you, gentlemen. Right. Hey, uh, let's just use the the seven one two number. Okay. Okay.